What's up, brothers and sisters? It's your brother, G World 7 underscore D. Here's a book. It's called Transformation of the Southeastern Indians, 1540 to 1760, edited by Robbie Etheridge and Charles Hudson. Now, you see, look at this. First of all, you see Negroes right there. These are Aboriginals. All right, but we're going to turn... In this book, I'm going to go to I'm read a few things. The brothers and sisters know this. Okay, right here. First off, right here. Let me get something to hold this. Let me get something to hold this. Hold on this end here. Let's we'll start right here. Right here, it says right here, the Aboriginal population movements in post in the post contact southeast. All right, <clears throat> I'm not gonna read that whole thing, but I'm gonna skip through certain parts and focus on certain parts. So let me look at, let me get some light here. Let's start off right. Ooh, get a little cover right here. Let's start off right here. All right, what well, says push and pull factors. There are many factors responsible for early native populations movements. A number are discussed below, and I have no doubt that other factors will occur to other scholars. I do not believe that there is a monolithic, excuse me, a mono casual explanation for the movements. Indeed, there is probably not even a single most important reason we can distinguish between push Next page. A little closer. factors which forced people to move away from their homes and pull factors which made other areas more attractive for settlement. Listed in no particular order are the factors I believe are important. One, okay, the push of disease. In early research, I rely heavily on the notion that introduced European epidemic disease was a big factor in population displacement of the 16th and 17th centuries. Why I am still... Let me get a better focus. Why I'm still convinced that this is, excuse me, why I'm, why I'm still convinced that this, that this was an important factor, I now believe it must be seen as only one of several factors causing movement. I have no doubt that major epidemics occurred and forced people to migrate or mitigate, excuse me. But I am less convinced of the frequency of those epidemics. I now suspect that this explanation has been given, excuse me, has been given, I'm out of focus again, has been given undue weight. Two, the push of political factorization, excuse me, of uh, factionism, with the breakdown of native societies following the stresses of contact by alien European nations and the introduction of diseases, there must have been increased competition for traditional leadership positions. Okay. As heirs to political position died before attaining office, competition must have accelerated. Given that Fractional competition was already a fact of life in Mississippian societies before contact. Okay, okay, one second. Okay, let me get back before contact. Okay, here it is right here. Let me get back to reading. It is likely that it is likely that the stresses of contact led to more conflict. It is also likely that decimated native societies had diminished means of managing disputes between kinship groups as, for example, in cases of clan or lineage vengeance. Okay. 
with desirable habitation areas opening up as a result of other factors. The opportunity for visiting was greater than ever. A faction, a faction could decide to pick up and move to a recently deserted area. Thus, for example, a number of Shawnee moved to the Savannah River following the destruction of the Westos by the English in 1681. But, note that only a few Shawnee moved, and not all of them called themselves Shawnee. The breakdown of Aboriginal societies into various fractions may also explain why some Natchez fled to the Chickasaw while others went to the Cherokees and Creeks. Massive depopulation by disease and warfare against Europeans or Native Americans recently armed with Europeans with European weapons meant that societies were certainly less socially uh, cer- Sir, 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 circumscribed. Excuse me. My thing's going to focus in, focus out, and thus have more options for fissioning and resettlement. As chiefly organized, excuse me, as chiefly organizations, as chiefly organization organization disintegrated, the glue that held society together lost its strength, sometimes resulting in social atomization. Because there is evidence of population, uh, oh shoot, hold up. Because there's evidence evidence of population coincidence in the late 16th and early uh, 17th centuries, I su- suspect that the visiting response was a late protohistoric factor. By the late protohistoric Aboriginal groups. Let me get it clear. Aboriginal groups were so reduced and relocated as to open up large vacant areas for resettlement by dissident factions. The pool of European settlement and trade, I believe this factor has often been exaggerated. While Native Americans clearly wanted exotic materials from Europeans, they had conducted long-distance trade for millennia before Europeans contact. They did not need to move closer to the Europeans to obtain material. None, nevertheless, the factor may have been responsible for movements towards the Spanish missions on the coast. The, the responsible for movement towards the Spanish... Oh, excuse me, I read that line again. The... Desire for European materials is often cited as reason many lower creeks left the Chattahoochee River in 1690 and moved to the Okuni and even the Savannah Rivers and, and even the Savannah Rivers. However, it should not be forgotten that there was also a simultaneous push for the lower creeks to get to it's going out of focus again to get away from the Spanish who had recently burned their towns on the Chattahoochee. Chattahoochee. All right. The pool of favorable environmental zones. The pool of favorable environmental zones. Certain areas have been favored for settlement for hundreds of years before European contact. Of particular interest was the fall line zone separating the coastal plain from the Piedmont uplands. This region, this region has many favorable characteristics, including fertile soil, excellent fishing, natural fords across rivers making for good access for trade and communication, and favorable mesh with the trail system. Lithic resources from two very different Baltic areas, and so and so on. As this area emptied out from depopulation and migration, 
other settlements, other settlers were quick to fill it in. Well, quick to fill it, yeah, quick to fill it in. Thus, as the barrier earned peoples of the Mon Montgomery, Alabama area abandoned. I'm going out of focus again. Okay, hold up. Okay, Montgomery, Alabama. Okay, thus, as the barrier earned peoples of the Montgomery, Alabama. Oh man, it's going out of focus. Were abandoned. Such sites as Tuskegee, probably around the middle of the 17th century. The coal, the coal, ascetic speaking people from the Upper Tennessee River Valley and the Alabama and the Alabama from Mississippi quickly moved in. Such movements are documented by the Spaniard. Marcos Delgado in 1686. Delgado remind us, reminds us that fear of armed natives and the slave trade also prompted the movement from the Tennessee area. Thus, there were both pushes away from the area and pulls to determine where the people went. The Iroquois Wars, I have the Iroquois Wars. I have wondered for years whether the heavily armed, let me get back in focus, the heavily armed Iroquois warriors had any major effects in the Southeast. I suspect that they did play a role, but it was mostly an indirect one until nearly the 18th century. We know from historical sources that the Iroquois rapidly conquered their western neighbors. The Windrow by 1638, the Huron by 1649, the Natural by 1652, and the Erie by 1656, displacing many people westward into the western Great Lakes region. By 1675, combination of Iroquois and Europeans eliminated the let me get out don't get out of focus the Susku Hennock Hennocks all right and I'm trying to stay in the focus this thing keep going in and out of focus I'm gonna read who lay to the south although many of these people were assimilated into the Iroquois lead to replace a rapidly diminishing population many others were forced westward and perhaps southward other groups are known primarily through archaeology. For example, the Monongahela culture of southwestern Pennsylvania, adjacent portion of West Virginia, Maryland, and Ohio, may be the archaeological manifestation of the Massawamek, who are sketchily described as historic accounts. According to the recent study by William Johnson, archaeological and ethnological and excuse me, archaeological and ethnographic, ethnohistoric, excuse me, data, archaeological and ethnohistoric data indicate the dispersal of Managala, uh, Managahila by AD 1635, almost surely at the hands of the Seneca. According to recent studies of the Fort Ancient Culture by the Penelope Duker, as well as my own studies of European trade materials from Kentucky and West Virginia, most fort ancient sites in the Ohio Valley appear to have been abandoned by the middle of the 17th century. I suspect that some of these displaced people probably affected the Deep South, either by direct movement or by forcing other movements in a domino effect. Marvin Jitter suggests that the Quapa may have moved to present Arkansas from the eastern fort ancient area noting especially the use of longhouses by both groups. It is well documented that the Iroquois displaced many people into the western Great Lakes regions. These newcomers, in turn, pushed other groups out onto the plains. I, su I suspect that some of the Great Lakes people may have also turned to the south. Thus the Mitch Chagemi, just the Mitch Chagemi, an Illini group, 
were found by Marquette and Joliet in northeastern Arkansas in 1673. The line were also documented enemies in the Chickasaw. I suspect that the southern exclusions were a recent event brought about by the movements into the Great Lakes area by groups of people fleeing the Iroquois. The Quapaw also may have moved into Arkansas in the late 17th century from the Ohio Valley. James Morrell notes that the, our, old, our earliest documented attack by the Iroquois on southern Indians, the old Caniches, was in 1677. Iroquois aggression probably accounts for the appearance of the Savannah Shawnees on the Savannah River in 1674. The Iroquois were a big factor in the eight, early 18th century Carolina frontier, according to Thomas Nareen. They had formerly attacked the Chickasaw and were still plaguing the Cherokee in 1708. The influence on the historically undocumented southeastern interior is harder to measure. Groups such as the Westos, who moved into the deep south from an intermediate location, Virginia, were probably pushed from the original homeland by various Iroquois depredations. Far more research needed in this area. But the push of captured territory. It has been well documented that warfare was waged between Mississippian societies. When a group's traditional enemy becomes weakened by disease, or when one group attained firearms earlier than another group, such as the imbalance of power allowed the victorious group to take over the loser's territory and the loser could be forced to move long distances or even to amalgamate with the victors. Marco Delegato documents many such movements of Tennessee Valley people south into the vicinity of the present Montgomery, Alabama in the late 17th century. Another example is dispersal of the Appalachians in 1704 and the subsequent reoccupation of the northern Florida by the Seminoles. The pool of Indian elites seeking to bolster their power by forming connections to the Spaniards. John Worth makes an interesting observation that native elites often moved their followers to be closer to the Spaniards to bolster their own power. The Spaniards gave presents to native leaders, often in the form of fancy clothing. These served as sumptuary goods to bolster the power of native chiefs. I suspect, however, that this factor was limited mainly to Spanish Florida. While Worth has clearly documented such movements of northern uh, Tim, Timu, Timucans to be closer to St. Augustine, I doubt that the pool extended very far into the interior southeast. The pool of missions, Worth notes, that some interior natives were attracted to the coastal missions and apparently moved there voluntarily. I suspect that much of the upper Okani River in Georgia was depopulated by 1650, as seen in the lack of mid to late 17th century European trade materials. In the site above the fall line, and that many of these people moved downstream to the coastal missions, others became known as the Yamasee. But these movements might also be related to the Westville depredations. Depredations. Further south, the history of Florida missions seem to be a continuous story of population reduction and relocation. The poor cultural similarities, James Morrell points out, that as groups amalgamated, they usually coincide with people speaking similar languages. His example is based on the Catawba of the Carolina Piedmont. While his observation is generally true, Notable expectations are known. Not all the group, not all of the group that became known as the Catawba was Sioux speakers. Consider also that some of the Natchez moved in with with the overall Cherokees, while others moved in with the Chickasaw and Upper Creeks. Very different linguistic groups. However, following the Morel's model, the various Kusa groups had amalgamated into Kusa, Ab, 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 Abaca, Upper Creeks by the 18th century. I can't pronounce that. Kusa, Ab, Abica, Upper Creeks. Okay. The slave trade. The slave trade. The English run trade in Aboriginal slaves dates to the last half of the 17th century in the first quarter of the 18th. I repeat. The slave trade. The English run trade in Aboriginal slaves dates to the last half of the 17th century in the first quarter of the 18th. J. Lechett Wright, 
notes that slavery was not important in early Jamestown because the colony was economically unstable and there was no real market for slaves. Caribbean islands were settled later and the market for slaves grew. Bermuda was established as an English colony in 1612, Barbados in 1627, Jamaica in 1655, Indian slaves were the first mentioned in Virginia statuettes in 1660. Thus, when the Carolina colony was when excuse me, thus when the Carolina colony was founded in 1670, the trade in Indian slaves may have been just expanding. The slave trade was often run by native middlemen praying preying on people who were sometimes their traditional enemies. This feature worked in combination with the warfare mentioned above. The Carolina slave trade began in coastal areas and gradually moved inland. The trade reached its height in the raids on the Florida missions and later during the Tuscarola and Yamasee War. James Moore captured over 4,000 slaves from his Florida raids in 1704. Although it is probable that many of these people were re relocated voluntarily, areas that had been depopulated by the slave trade often became attractive locations for settlement by natives from elsewhere. Thus, in the 18th century, Creeks and Yamasees moved to northern Florida to occupy the former territory of uh, the Appalachians. All of these factors and probably others caused the linked population movements during the proto-historic period. Although it is difficult to prove with available data, I suspect that native movements accelerated during this period of the Indian slave trade reached a peak in the early 18th century. Soon thereafter, many of the population aggregates known from the last two-thirds of the 18th century until the removal of the 19th century were pretty much in place. That is not to say that more population movements did not occur after the first third of the 18th century, but they are but they were more gradual and the movements were for shorter distances. Thus, for example, the Cherokee gradually moved into the northern Georgia during the 18th century. By and large, the period of long distance elites was over until Indian removal, a long distance movement of different of a different sort. There are important lessons to be learned here. While I have previously taken the view of assuming that most Native American movements were for short distances usually downstream, history teaches us that long distances were often involved. Some Native groups fizzed and went into seven directions. For example, after the Natchez Revolt in 1729, some Natchez joined the Chickasaw while others joined the Overhill Cherokees or the Upper Creeks. The Shawnee traveled to many places in both the Southeast and the Northeast. Having proposed this list of push and pull factors, I had to add the qualification that it is entirely possible that the population movement suggested in this paper, as well as some of my previous efforts, are really oversimplifications of the truth. Okay, we're going to stop right there. We're going to stop right there. <laughs> we're going to stop right there. All right, this is just another explanation of that there was a heavy Indian slave trade here in America. And those Indians were black. All right? And it comes from this book, The Transformation of the Southeastern Indians, 1540 to 1760. All right? Here's a cover showing you Negroes. All right? I want to say this is the Yuchi, but this is, this is our history that has been suppressed. Most of us was already here. The first slave trade happened with the black people here, and they also brought in expelled Europeans out of Europe, the Moors. But these are the black, aboriginal black people here in America. Like I said before in my other posts, our downfall was greedy Negroes fighting amongst each other for power and land. And then they end up capturing other groups and then using those other Negroes as slaves. Slavery started here. Would sell out Negroes from other tribes going at the other blacks. It started here. It did not start in no Africa. It started here. I want to make this clear. I'm going to continue to bang in this issue, man. Because this is something I'm tired of Pan Africans, man. I'm tired of them just finding out lying about our history. They, most of them have not done no serious research. And I, I hear these Negroes, male and female. Many of these Negroes went to these Eastern universities or these Ivy League schools like Harvard. Uh, yeah, and it continued to be jackasses, man. 
They don't know history. They don't know anything. They now haven't done real research. This is doing real research. I'm going to give you another source. The Transformation of the Southeastern Indians, 1540 to 1760. All right? Get this book. This is a good book. And this tells you about our, our history. It has many different essays and journals by different authors, man. Check this book out. This is a good book to have, man. I'm going to show you this book again. All right? I was trying to read with my phone. And I just, when I took away from my phone because my phone kept getting out of focus. So I just started to just <laughs> read it straight up, man. <laughs> so so that's why it was bothering me. My phone was getting out of focus. But this is an exceptional book. The Transformation of the Southeastern Indians, 1540 to 1760. This is our true history, man. Most of us were not brought over here on no slave ship for no Africa in the bottom of a ship, man, of a cargo ship. Technically, it was a cargo ship. That's that's not true. There were slaves brought here, but most of the slaves, the people who were enslaved were here, and they had expelled black Europeans. Do not listen to people who just tell you you come from Africa and want to try to argue you down. Those are ignorant idiots, man. We need to wake up and do some serious research now. Power is in knowledge. Power. Knowledge with this power. Getting all this knowledge brings you power. And also it strengthens who you are as a person inside for your love for who you are. So we got to wake up. Stop listening to these individuals, man. Talking that Pan-African stuff. You hear Pan-Africans all the time. Well, North America. The blacks were here in North America a certain time. All of North America was covered with ice. Canada. And most of, uh, a large part of the United States was covered with ice, but a lot of the southern tip and South America wasn't. <laughs> so the early civilizations were in the South, South America, and they migrated up into North America. All right, so I got books in that. But I, I think we really going to have to do the serious research. And I challenge brothers and sisters to do that. All right, so... I was, I'm using my phone, and I know it's shaking and stuff like that. And it was getting out of focus, like I just mentioned. But hey, man, the information's there. This talks about the Indian slave trade and how it started to peak in the 18th century. And man, let me tell you something, man. What? We talking about that. It was, we keep talking about the African slave trade. So basically, it was the Indian slave trade, enslaving black people here. Most of the slaves that were enslaved black people were slaves were Indians. They were black people. They were indigenous aboriginal black Indians. They weren't no damn Africans. I know it's hard for some of these Negroes on YouTube to get this, to understand this, but they were aboriginal blacks, not no damn Africans. All right, I'm going to make this clear. I'm going to continue to bang on this, man. I'm banging this hard because this needs to be said. I'm tired of people just saying that we come from Africa. I'm tired of some self-hating Negroes who, when you say this, they say that we have self-hate. No, they have self-hate because they're afraid to learn their true history because they're afraid to get white daddy and white mommy mad at them. We don't have time for that. We need to move as a people. We need to grow as a people. Majority of our people are already here. Majority of our people did not come, like I repeat this again over and over again, but from the bottom of the slave ship from Africa. That is wrong information. That's outdated information. And that's tired as information. This is your world, brother G World. Peace and love. Stay black. Stay true. You're an Aboriginal. You are the true Indian. All right. We are an indigenous people of land. Now, I'm not saying we need to get into the tribal mess. That's part of a problem that we lost our empires. We should be fighting amongst each other. Peace and love.